Today's episode is sponsored by Planning Center. Planning Center is a software developed by worship leaders for worship leaders. It's the absolute best way to plan, schedule, and resource your teams for your upcoming services. There's pretty much nothing Planning Center can't do. It can host your core charts, schedule your team, request team members to block out dates when they're unavailable. It can automatically schedule your team. It can transpose core charts. It can transpose MP3s. It can host your multi-track files. It can do pretty much anything. And I want to encourage you, if you're not using Planning Center, you're making your life too complicated. It will simplify and streamline your administrative processes at your church by a thousand percent. I'm not exaggerating. And if you don't believe me, you can try the software completely free for 30 days if you go to planningcenter.com. I want to encourage you to go to planningcenter.com. Plans start at just $14 a month after your 30-day trial expires. So go try it, and I guarantee you, you will love it. Planningcenter.com. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Worship Ministry Training Podcast, a monthly podcast where we give you the practical training and tools you need to have a healthy worship ministry. And listen, I recently released a brand new free resource for you. It's a one-hour course called Eight Essential Elements of a Thriving Worship Ministry. This is pretty much everything you need to know in order to have a thriving, healthy, vibrant worship ministry. So I'm going to encourage you to go to worshipministrytraining.com forward slash thrive, and you can get that free course absolutely free. Just put your email in and enjoy the one hour teaching that I do there. Today, I have the great privilege of talking with one of the godfathers of the modern worship movement, Paul Balash. We've had him on the podcast before. Last time, he talked about how to have a long and fruitful ministry, how to last the long haul. Well, this time, he's talking about how to have a long and fruitful marriage. So Paul's been married over 30 years now to his beautiful bride, Rita. They've had a ministry together. They've sung songs together and they still love each other deeply. And this is a rarity nowadays because many people, even in the church and even pastors have really broken and messed up marriages where they get their priorities out of whack. And now if you're listening and you're not married, you still should listen to this episode because who knows, you might be married one day, Lord willing. And so Get these lessons now from somebody who's been through it all and who has some wisdom to share. And I just want to say Paul is one of the most generous, kind people that you'll ever meet. And even just a great follow on Twitter and on Facebook. He's always promoting other people's stuff and sharing people's stuff. And so shout out Paul Balash for being a genuine, authentic, kind and generous human being. We love you. Thank you for the wisdom you share in this episode. You guys are going to get a lot out of this. And let's dive into my conversation with Paul Balash. Hey, everybody. I am here with the one and only Paul Balash. Paul, how you doing? Hi, Alex. Good to see you, brother. Coming from New York City? Or are you not in the New York City or are you just in New York State? Where are you at? In, right in the city, right on 12th Street. <laughs> Crazy. Right in the middle of the epicenter of the coronavirus. Pretty much. Yeah, but you're safe and we're glad for that. Yeah, yeah. Paul, you were on the podcast, I think it was three years ago, and man, you dropped some major gold. We talked about faithfulness and fruitfulness and longevity in ministry. Mm. And I'm going to encourage the listeners to go back and check that out. I'll put it in the show notes. But I wanted to chat with you about marriage in ministry and really maintaining a healthy marriage in ministry because you and your wife, Rita, have been married now for 33 years. Congratulations. Thank you. That's a long time. Uh And you still love each other. Like you, this quarantine, you've been posting videos of you and Rita singing together, singing worship songs, singing James Taylor songs Uh and looking at each other all googly eyed. And it's just, it's so beautiful, you know, and 33 years, that's, that's a marathon. That's a long game. Mm. And it takes intentionality to stay healthy through the many seasons of life. So I, I wonder, maybe just like We'll do kind of a rapid fire to start. Okay. Like maybe what are just one, two, three things in marriage that have really been a huge part of the success of your marriage? Wow. Okay. Well, I mean, commitment's the first thing that just comes to mind. I mean, just you're 100% committed to each other. You know, commitment, love, and forgiveness. Those are three words that the first ones that come out of my mouth. Uh, Yeah. So... Yeah, love as in, um, I'm I'm always challenged by 1 Corinthians 13. We're all familiar with love is patient, love is kind, 
let's just stop right there. Hello. Mm -hmm. I've I've teased over the years many times, like, I'm just going to rip this page out of the Bible and I'm going to work on this for the next 10 years. Like the rest of the Bible, I'll get to it. But if I can just work on love is patient, love Mm -hmm. is kind, love is patient, love is kind. I mean, think about it. I mean, that is the key to a healthy relationship, I, I would argue a healthy marriage, because it's the biblical definition of love. That word is thrown around so easily and so casually in, in our culture and around the world. Um, but let's go back to the biblical definition. You know, the whole chapter, of course, is fantastic. First Corinthians 13, sometimes we only hear that at a wedding. But man, go there and don't let it be a cliché. Let, let it really challenge your heart and go, all right, if I say I love, you know, we, we all would think of ourselves as loving people, probably everybody listening to this. We would think, well, I'm a Christian and I love people and I love my neighbor and, you know, I, I, I help them out and I, I give some money to a homeless guy yesterday and, I, you know, I love people. Well, that's all good, you know. You know, God so loved the world and yet I feel like marriage – God says, okay, I'm going to give you one human being to practice on. Mm. You want to learn how to love? It's easy to say, oh, I love you. Hey, I love you people. Good night, Cincinnati. (laughs) (laughs) You know, if you're doing a concert or whatever, love you guys. Um, But, you know, in a marriage, it's where you really get to practice like nothing else, to to love Mm. this one human being. It's like God says, Okay, so you think you're pretty good at love, huh? Okay, we'll start with this one human being, and let's see how good you are at forgiving. Let's mm-hmm. see how good you are at not taking everything personal and being easily offended. That's another definition of love. Love is not easily offended. Uh, mm-hmm. Let's see if you can practice patience overlooking things that, you know, and I'm not talking about, let's just say right up front, we're not talking domestic violence or abuse or anything like that, where I'm assuming whoever I'm talking to, when I say commitment and like closing the door on divorce and things like that, I'm assuming that your marriage is not in a dangerous place. You're not in some uh, personal, physical, emotional danger. Although sometimes when, uh, when things are going rough, we can sort of play that card. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. Sometimes it's a card that is absolutely true. But sometimes we can play it a little dishonestly and we can pull that card out too soon and we can say, you know, you offend me you know, emotionally, you've abused me emotionally or whatever. Or, and I, for sorry to even make that voice, that's I don't I don't mean that because I know there very well could be people listening to this that um, their situation is is like hell and I don't discount that or minimize it. I'm simply talking to people that say are honest if they look in the mirror and go, you know, overall, you know, we're good. We're, we're good. I mean, we're, we're not in that dangerous territory, but things are hard. Things have been hard. They're better now. Uh, we've been in seasons where it's been really challenging, blah, blah, blah. So that was only one question. So I, I don't want to just ramble on for an hour here. No, that's good. It's good. So commitment, love, and forgiveness are the three keys that you, and I just, out of curiosity to dig in a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Why did you start with commitment? Why commitment? Because again, in this day and age, we're so feelings oriented. I think, you know, we're so influenced by movies and songs and in a good way, you know, like it's romantic and it's idealized. And yet at the end of the day, love is, I don't know. I feel like love is commitment. Like that's the Mm -hmm. first word that comes to mind. Love's not a feeling. Uh, feelings, oftentimes they're there, but sometimes they're not there. And you show up, you, you quote unquote, show up with your body, soul, mind, and spirit every day, ready Mm -hmm. for action, ready to love this human being that you made a Mm -hmm. commitment to, to do life with. And in many Mm -hmm. cases to bear children and to raise children. And so I feel like commitment will get you through a lot of the ups and downs Mm. When, when even the the thought of like, man, you know, your flesh, your, your emotions, your feeling, you're just like, I'm out of here, man. This is just too hard. Forget this. You know, 
And we all have those times and feelings. And I think for people to deny that and say, oh no, my marriage is completely perfect and we never have those hardships and feelings, that's that's a lie. That's not true, you know? And that's where commitment, like it it has to be there to get us pushed through those hard times. Absolutely. You know? And and um yeah. and that's what I'm trying to be really honest right up front because I've been annoyed when I see, you know, Miss Ken and Barbie, you know, like the Mr. <laughs> Mrs. Perfect couple get up and um, you know, and I'm not even picking on anybody. I'm just saying the more transparent we can be as leaders, the healthier yeah. it will be for others. Um, and we can still give good advice and encourage and say, these are ideals, these are principles, but also be honest and say, I have not arrived yet. I'm still working on it, you know. Um, but commitment, yeah, yeah, uh, real quick. Um, over 33 years, when I think of maybe a few times where it was like, wow, super hard season, if we were not in a healthy church and had good friends that were close who came alongside us, et cetera, we might've thrown in the towel. One of us might've said, I'm out of here. But commitment says, I'll go another day. Let me sleep on it. Let me put that off and go another day. Let me wake up tomorrow and see if I can deal with my hurt and my, my anger. And let me go talk to healthy friend or pastor or counselor and see if I can process this in a healthy way. But commitment, what that does is six months later, when you look back, hindsight, oh man, you go, oh, thank God I didn't do something crazy. Thank God. Mm. Oh, wow. Thank you, Lord. That Thank you that by your grace, I didn't bail. Like, cause things are pretty good right now. Things are actually really good. And oh, wow, Lord, I I didn't even think this was possible six months ago. Right. That's so good. That's so good, Paul. Now, a lot of us in ministry, you've been in ministry maybe even longer than you've been married or close to the same amount of time. A lot of leaders will get the balance wrong where they'll put ministry above their marriage or above their family. Why do you think that happens? And what what would you say to a leader who's struggling with that? Because I think we all do. Oh, We're like, we chase on. after the ministry. Come on. I'm guilty as charged, man. Super guilty. Yeah. Um, this is almost kind of cathartic to talk about it. It's good for me. It's like a therapy session. Yes. Good. <laughs> um, it's helpful to us too. For real. Um, absolutely. Well, you know, we learn from our mistakes. You know, they say that you can learn from experience or you can learn from wisdom. Wisdom is learning from other people's mistakes. Experience is learning from your own mistakes. Um, mm-hmm. So there are times where I thought, yeah, I really know how to do this. I've read the marriage books. I'm going to be good at this, you know? And um, it just doesn't always work out. Like, you know, people are not books. People are not principles. And you're living with another human being with, they're a mystery. And what was the question again? So the, the question was, uh, like, why do we get that backwards oh, so yeah, often yeah. with, yeah. Well, why? Man, a lot of reasons, maybe ego, insecurity, uh, fear, a lot of fear, because a lot of people in ministry, we're, we're trying to, we, we've never done this before. I remember saying that in my mid thirties, like, how did I say yes to so many things? I looked at my calendar and it's like, I'm going to be gone for the next two weeks. And then when I come home, I got to do lead worship, but then I'm gone again Monday and I'm doing this YWAM school that's for, and then I have to fly here. And, and I would just say to my wife, like, I'm sorry, I don't, I've never done this before. I don't know. There's no like manual. It's like, I'm I'm getting Mm -hmm. this wrong and you're right. I've overcommitted and I'm really sorry. And, uh, so it's like, let's, let's, let me try to be more aware. So why was I overcommitted? Well, I was getting paid part time at the church, um, which I was grateful for. Uh, but we were living in, well, we started off in a little mobile home and then we graduated to like this little manufacturer type home and having another kid and then another kid. And I'm giving guitar lessons and making a little money at the church. And somebody says, well, you know, if you come here, we'll pay you $300. So it's a little bit of provision, you know, like you're looking, Hey, this is God's way of providing for my family. It's a little bit of ego in that kind of feels good for somebody to ask you to do something like wow. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Uh, yeah, I'll do it. And, uh, you know, and you're all figure you're figuring that stuff out in your twenties and your thirties, especially. So you got to give yourself some grace 
that um, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to overcommit. You're going to, and when I say ego, it's not so obvious in the moment because in the, in, it's mixed with spiritual God stuff too. There's scriptures like mm -hmm. to him who's been given much, uh, love much or, uh, to, um, what's the much will be required. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and you know, you kind of feel the, the responsibility of the world on your shoulders. Like if I don't go, who will hear if, if I don't go, how will they hear, you know? So here are my Lord, send me, you know, and all these earnest spiritual, uh, goals, you know, these the d spiritual desires. Um, however, we also have to acknowledge and be honest that there's a mixture there. We're always, there's a mm -hmm. mixture of spiritual desires that are healthy, but also as the apostle Paul said to Timothy, he, or he referred to vain ambitions. I think mm -hmm. that was in Philippians, actually. So uh, I just like that King James. It said vain ambitions. And I used to mm -hmm. just be, be aware of those vain ambitions, or we might call that ego, you know, that desire mm -hmm. to sort of be noticed or to be valued or to be, hey, way to go, and pats on the back. And that's, that's not a crime that that we enjoy that to a degree. Like we, we need some encouragement in our lives. So my point is, as long as we're just trying to go through this with our eyes wide open and not kid ourselves and realize there'll always be a percentage of ego in our, in our spiritual walk. And so just be aware of it and keep it in the light and be aware that there's always that possibility that we're going to say yes to too many things or we're going to, I don't know, you know, fill in the blank, but I hope, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And then I think our poor wives in our case is wives, but maybe if there's female worship leaders listening to their husbands, it's like they're at home dealing with the kids while you're out playing at some conference and having fun and eating delicious meals like catered to you yeah. and this and yeah. that. And they're like, what am I chopped liver? I'm just sitting here like dealing with the kids by myself yeah. and the laundry's piled up yeah. and the house is a mess and I can't keep on top of it because my husband's gone doing ministry and serving everyone else, but he won't serve me. Yeah. Yeah. Like totally I've, I've had seasons in my life like that. And I try not to have that now. Did you ever have seasons where, uh, ministry was like a divisive thing between you and Rita? And if so, talk about that. If not, then great. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we're just coming clean today. This is the coming clean episode here. <laughs> Um, yeah, nothing to hide. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, it, even though we did ministry together quite often, Rita, she was tremendous support. She sang side by side with me on the platform many times. But then as we'd have children, sometimes she would have to deal with that. But I am st was still the guy sort of being asked maybe to go places. And sometimes we would go together and it was wonderful like to be involved in ministry and marriage. And there's so much good to that. Um, but my temperament... I had a lot of ministry people uh, have a temperament similar to mine where you you try to please you, you try to please almost everyone you try to not offend you and that's where the overcommitment comes in so I think there were times where without a doubt I mean if she was here so I'll just say yeah she would say yeah I would, whether it was writing songs I'd be at the church we had a little studio that the keyboard player and I set up so if I wasn't traveling, then I was also at the church, not only doing church stuff, but trying to write and demo songs. Sometimes, you know, dinner was going to be around seven, but uh, we're just trying to finish this one last track. And so I get home at eight o'clock instead. Well, that's just disrespectful, you know, and mm. and she would be rightfully mad. But at the time, I didn't see a reason to be mad because I'm justifying. So we justify, we justify and here, ready for it we have this card that we can play that no one can, can refute. It's the God card. Mm. <laughs> we just pull that card out. It's like the ace of spades. It's like, there we go. It's like some kind of a card game. You're like, you lay the God card down. How can they argue with that? You're like, yeah, but it's for the Lord. It's for the Lord. It's ministry. It's da da da. And then when I realized after a few years that that doesn't quite cut it, that's sometimes when I go to my, the other excuse was like, babe, I don't know. I'm still figuring this out. You're absolutely right. I overcommitted. I don't know what I was thinking. I thought I could kind of get all this in, squeeze it in. And I'm really sorry. So that's all the, I'm sharing a lot of negative stuff. I could share some positive things that I tried to do. 
Yeah, I'd like to actually talk about that next because uh, so the, there were seasons where there was tension between the marriage and the ministry, but there were a lot of seasons where it was really well played together. Um, obviously, you shared that you guys used to sing together um, and she would support you in the things you were doing, but maybe share more on the side of like things that you did well to prioritize your family over the ministry. Um, what were some of those things? One component that really helped us a lot was being part of a of a church where we had real friends, like real friends you could count even on one hand. But so when I was mm-hmm. traveling or if I was busy, my wife did have a few good girlfriends that she could call and hang with or they get together. And like, so that's important to make sure you have um, – friendships that I have some good guy friends. She has good girl friends. And, uh, that was a good outlet and a healthy thing for us. And then as couples, we were able to kind of process things with other couples maybe, and also couples that were not in ministry. That was helpful. It was a good, healthy balance for me to be around people because so much of my life was about like music and writing songs and ministry and this and that and da da da. And you just kind of get caught up and that becomes your whole world. And it was good to be thrown in with friends who were like, he owned a carpet cleaning business, you know, and she was a housewife raising three kids, homeschooling. And when we got together, we didn't really talk about music or ministry. It was, so that was healthy. Mm. Um, also when I was home, I tried to be 100% home. Mm. Um, I, I didn't have hobbies. There was no such thing as a hobby. My kids were my hobbies. Now, Don't be offended if somebody hears that. Oh, that's terrible. Simply what I mean by that is rather than like being gone and working, you know, 50, 60, who knows how much, how many hours a week. But then whenever I was home, oh, babe, I'm going to go play golf now or I'm going to go. It was like, no, 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 no. When I'm home, I'm I'm doing dishes. I'm taking a trash Mm -hmm. shot. I'm looking for some of those honeydew projects that are I'm trying to anticipate some of her needs. Mm -hmm. Um it's really important to go through that, the love language book. And if you don't know what your partner's love language is, then you got to do that immediately. You need to find that out and make sure, because you may think you're loving this person and yet it may not be hitting their heart whatsoever because Mm -hmm. they don't receive love. That's not their language. So you're trying to love them, maybe words of affirmation, words of affirmation, and maybe their love language is acts of service. <laughs> so you could talk all day long and say, you're amazing, hon. You're awesome, babe. You're great. And, and they just want you to like, can you please get that lawnmower fixed so that we can cut that lawn? And will you please take this to the shop? And will you finally get that, uh, you know, get the oil changed on the car? Cause that red light's been on seems like for a month now, you know, the, <laughs> the dummy light, right. et cetera, et cetera. You know, um, so that's important. Also, go another step. Uh, you hear a lot these days about the Enneagram. That's just one of many options. You could do that. And the thing that's helpful about those is not to put your spouse in a box and say, oh, well, you're always this. No, but it does give a lot of insight into, wow, so that's why, oh, well, that makes sense. And so all this time I've been taking it personal when she doesn't this or, or does this or when the reality is, is nothing to do with me. It's just it's she's kind of made a lot like she's a bit more melancholy. Like that's just the way she is. And that goes with her artistic temperament and and all the creative things that I was attracted to and thought were awesome. The other side of that is, you know, it's a person that likes to be alone at times or have some alone time or et cetera. I don't know, all the melancholy traits. Um, uh, I remember this counselor famously saying, well, Rita, so here's the problem. So the reason why it takes you so long to get out of church every Sunday, because she's like, why are we, we're always the last to leave. It's like, we're the first people there and we just, we're always the last to leave. And our kids are like, we got to have lunch. We got to go to lunch. It's one o'clock. Da, da, da. So, and the counselor said, well, Rita, so here's the problem. See, between the platform and the exit door, there are people. And see, Paul is unable to walk past somebody without making eye contact and saying, hey, 
hey, you guys doing? You doing all right? And so it became like a little joke in our family that I say, well, I'm going to try to do better. And I've got to do a little bit of that because I feel like a pastor is more than a guy that gets up and plays songs. Like I got to hang out a little bit afterwards, maybe a little prayer for someone or just, but I don't need to stay for an hour either. So there is a balance. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when my kids, as they started growing, they put my guitar in its case, they'd roll up my cables and they'd be like, all right, dad, as I'm talking to somebody, we're, we're, um, we're ready to go. Um, so, Cute. so then we'd, uh, start making our way to the door and my wife would say, okay, just look down, babe. Just look down. Don't, don't look. That's it, babe. You got it. You got this. Just keep, just look down or, or just look at me, talk to me. We're talking, you and I just make eye contact with me. Uh-huh. We're almost to the door. Uh-huh. We're almost there. Uh-huh. Yep. We're almost there. Great. All right. We're almost to the car. Don't look, we did don't it. look to your right. Don't look to your right. Some nice people are to your right. Don't look at them. Just keep looking at me like we're talking. And we did it. We made it to our car. Yay. That's hilarious. That's hilarious. I, there's so much gold in that answer that I want to pull out. So one thing you said that was helpful was that when you were home, you were fully home. You were totally present to your kids and your family and you made it a point to do the honeydew list and to wash the dishes and to be a help, you know? And I, I think that's really hard right now with smartphones, you know, and all that stuff. But I think that's a good encouragement to all of our listeners is just like put the smartphone in the sock drawer. I actually have a feature on this phone that like it turns off like I can't use it until like <laughs> the morning. Awesome. Um, and and uh, so that's something that's really cool that you said. The other thing, though, is just serving your spouse's needs as much as you serve the needs of the people at church. Like they shouldn't get our leftovers, you know, in right. fact, they should get our best. And yet often we go and we give everyone else our best and then we come home to our spouse and we're tired and grumpy. Yeah. And that's just like not fair. It's not- and then the other thing that you said was like, you studied to understand her, mm. you know, and to understand who is this person I live with, the good and the bad. And then how do we help each other yeah. in that? Yeah. And also, also you guys, sounds like you went to counseling. I've gone a couple times to counseling with my wife and I want to go more, honestly. I'd like to go a lot more. I just think it's really healthy and helpful. But you guys were actively working on your marriage, so that's good. At different times, yeah, at different times. And let me throw in two quick caveats. Uh, the other thing, when when children started growing, I felt like my job was the athletic director. So, like, dad is the athletic director. So when I would come home from a trip, my goal was, like, get those kids outside, give mom some headspace. And even awesome. when you come home from, from your job, you may be tired, but like, even if you can just like, Hey guys, good to see you. All right, guys, come on, get your sneakers on. Let's go. We're going outside. Come on, let's go. We're going outside. Here we go. Boom, 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 boom. Whether it was riding bikes or rollerblading back in the day, or, uh, you know, walking a few blocks of the park and there was, uh, you know, different things you could do there. So, um, but the goal was for me was to get my kids away from my wife so she could just have a little head space which was so important to her. And um, also when I started traveling with a band, when we would kind of get to the airport, we'd about about ready to say goodbye. Hey guys, uh, we'll see you uh, next month or see you in a couple of weeks. One of us would always bring up the fact that, hey guys, we're, we're wasted. It was a great weekend. We poured out, we gave, it was amazing. But you know, in a couple hours, we're going to be walking in our front door and let's not give our wives the leftovers, what you just said. So sometimes as a band, we would pray, Lord, give us grace and energy and strength that when we walk in the door, we're, we're positive. We've got energy, you know, really love equals energy. And <laughs> that's another side mm. note. But when we say we want to love our wives, it's like, it's energy guys. It's like, it's giving energy, not coming in depleted of energy. So if that, whatever you have to do before you open that front door and walk in, you just say, Lord, I need extra grace right now. I don't have it in my own flesh. I'm so wiped. We've got barely got any sleep poured out, but that's not an excuse. Lord, I pray for grace and strength and, and a good attitude to walk in that door right now and express love. So, mm. yeah, that's good. So, marriage is, it's a fight in a sense, you know, to keep it healthy, there's offense and defense. Uh, I'd love to hear some of your offensive tactics to make your marriage stronger over the years. And then I'd love to hear some of the things you did on the defensive to protect your marriage and to, to safeguard it. So do you want to talk about offense first? Yeah. Well, one offense, defense made me think this 
oftentimes when we would go to a counselor or something, either her and I would have this revelation to like, hey, just a reminder, babe, I'm not against you. It's you and me against the world. Amen. It's you and me against the enemy of our soul. It's you and me against the enemy that wants to come and steal, divide, and conquer our, our family. And so even though we're working on some things that are hard and difficult, I'm, I'm still on your side. I hope you see it that yeah. way, that it's you and me against. So as opposed to so me against her or right. vice versa. So that's really helpful to establish as an overarching theme and principle in your marriage. So on the offense, there is a scripture, I think it's in first Peter, but live with your wives in an understanding way. I love that scripture. Like you need to understand some of the idiosyncrasies and don't see them as what's good and what's bad. Even that kind of language isn't helpful. Just see it as it's, this is the whole person that I married. And some things are, I love, they're so appealing. And other things are like, I don't understand. I don't relate. And that's difficult. But it's not necessarily wrong. Because for years at times, I would think I was right and she was wrong. I'd say, let's go to a counselor because I pretty much know that like, if she would just do A, B, and C, we'd be fine. And then <laughs> what a revelation when I realized, wow, I got stuff I need to work on. I got to so one offensive thing is to make it your ambition, one of your life ambitions, keep working on your own stuff. Like as Jesus said, you start, let's start dealing with all that telephone pole in your own eye, that big log, before you start pointing out the splinters in your spouse's eye. So defense, defense wise, um, yeah, like even even protecting from like infidelity or those types of things as well. So what were anything that you guys did on that front? Yeah, well, having having close friends, like legit friends, guy friends, girlfriends um, that you meet with on a regular basis. If you're not connected locally to guys, it I'm not talking about Sunday morning. Hey, good morning, church. Let's stand together. Not those people, but the Tuesday morning prayer breakfast, you know, or even just a coffee. Uh, where you guys can go through some books or go through also just some questions of going around, especially lust, pornography, all those, you know, a lot of guy issues. And yet some women wrestle with those issues, too. Uh, we need that for our own sake, for our own sake, for the health of our own. That, that's dealing with our own stuff instead of looking at your partner and going, well, yeah, but yeah, but, you know, he or she needs to work on it. Well, OK. Well, there's plenty to work on in our own lives. So, you know, filters on the just things that create roadblocks. Mm -hmm. And as well as knowing that Tuesday, um, I'm going to see so-and-so and and I'm going to see so-and-so. And and if he asks me, I don't want to feel like a piece of dirt. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to be able to answer like, yeah, uh, man, uh, yeah, crossed my mind, had an opportunity, but... Uh, thankfully I picked up my guitar and I just was practicing my scales <laughs> or yeah. I went for a run. I got on my bike. I find that physical exercise is really good for guys, especially just to kind of get that, uh, get that thing out, you know, go run and go get them on a bike. And even the physicality of a guitar, like just, um, you know, work just that the physical, having an instrument in your hands and working on, on new things. Yeah. That just takes up time, creativity in a healthy way. So that's offensive stuff or defensive, I mean, Uh, traveling, not traveling alone, always having a guy with you years and years ago. I didn't know when I was just starting to get asked to go places. I got asked to do this conference in Canada and I remember showing up and Brian Dirksen do you remember Brian Dirksen? Yeah. Refiner's fire, you're my mm-hmm. one. Or come, now is the time, to, the worship. time to worship. So many songs. I love Brian, but I'll never forget this. I was, I don't know, late 20s. And he was like, after a few minutes, he's like, so yeah, well, good to finally meet you, Paul. I mean, I've heard, you know, just know a little bit about you. I think I had like one album with Integrity at the time. And, uh, but so do you travel alone? I was like, well, yeah. He goes, well, why? I was like, I mean, I don't know. Just didn't want to like ask the guy for another ticket. Felt kind of weird. You know, I was just honored to be invited. He said, wow. 
said, yeah, I, I would never do that. I would never risk my marriage uh, just because someone mm. else was unwilling to buy a plane ticket. And then he said, he says, I'm a fragile human being. That was, that became, I, cause I came home and I told my wife about this conversation and we, mm. in a healthy way, we, it became an inside joke with Rita and I, we'd look at each other at times and go, I'm a fragile human being. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just a, a really beautiful, honest admission on Brian's part to say, you know, I'm fragile. Like I'm, I don't put anything past, I'm capable of anything. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I have found that just, uh, being able to travel with one other person just removes about 95% of that, of any sort of temptation or possibility. And it's like, wow, you know, cause even if you're a guy, you're in a hotel room back in the day, you know, and it was, uh, before there was internet, even. yeah, there was yeah. Interview, all that stuff. And you would just, just be fighting these thoughts that even good men. So this is the, this is the reality. Right. These we're talking about good men here. We're not talking about perverts. We're not talking about, right. we're talking about healthy red blooded men that really want to do good and be good men. That's what I'm talking about here. Yeah. And I, every, every guy I know has to some degree struggled or wrestled with that part of our mm -hmm. nature. So you don't have to live in this box of shame and think that you're, some pervert for even thinking these thoughts. No, you're, you're kind of, that's biology. A lot of it's biology, but our job as believers is to bring it under control, you know, by the power of the Holy spirit and accountability. Mm -hmm. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. That's good. No, it's really good. And, and, um, I have an episode that I did, gosh, also three or four years ago called wise boundaries with the opposite sex, uh, in ministry. And that's with Dr. Zach Carter, who actually got his PhD of, around the subject of, interpersonal relationships between genders. And so I'll put a link in the show notes, but yeah, I think it's so important that we have rules that we follow. Like I don't text women unless like only about a ministry question, like, can you sing the song in this key? Like that's the extent of my texting relationships with women. Right. Like if, if they're in my office, the doors open, yeah. my wife, believe it or not, is my accountability partner because I found that like telling her something is so horrible and so hard that it keeps me from being an, an idiot most of the time, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, not everybody can, can do that. And even for us, it was a multi-year journey to get to that point. It uh -huh. was really hard, uh -huh. but yeah, having those defensive mechanisms in place, some rules that you and your wife agree upon. Like, I love that. I don't travel alone ever. Like that's just so, that's so wise. So what, what's one thing now that you appreciate about marriage that you didn't understand when you were younger? Man, the, the depth of friendship and relationship, like it's just such a deep, such a deep thing. Yeah. I mean, friendship is just, I don't know, that's maybe that sounds shallow. <laughs> it's not though. Uh, friendship you've done, I mean, Reed and I, we've done 33 years together. Before that we were platonic friends for three years. We were both wild and crazy kids doing rock and roll stuff. And then both got born again separately. And then when we you too, me too. And that became sort of our, our friendship with each other it was as we were our first couple of years in the Lord, she was just trying to walk the straight and narrow and me too. And just trying to, we were just platonic friends, learning things about the Lord and like, Hey, and I moved to California, went to a music school and we kept in touch and all that. And then I eventually came back to Jersey, married her. So we were friends, you know, over more than half our lives we've been together. So, uh, so, you know, here we have been quarantined together for six weeks and we're not like at each other's throats. I mean, we've had a few moments where it's like, I think we need, I think I just need to go disappear. But we've reappreciated over the last few weeks, even how just hanging out. Hey, buddy. We call, hey, buddy, how's it going? Hey, buddy. You know, and I think about some of the things we've gone through the, shoo, man. You know, we've been through hard things and amazing things. Now we have three grandchildren. It's like, sheesh, that's an amazing milestone. Like, how did that even happen? It seemed like yesterday our kids were just just raising little kids. And now we've got three little grandkids. So, mm. And that's the legacy of commitment, right? It's yeah. right there, all full circle, back to commitment. Like, if you would have given up 
at any point or have would have let some sort of intruder into the relationship to break it up, like you would miss out on this deep well of friendship and experience and life journey that you now have with this one person. And in a sense, you're like so connected that you like have not achieved fully, but that one flesh relationship. And the fruit of that now is like healthy kids, healthy grandkids, a legacy of good fruit that hasn't been tainted by a bad ending. And it's just like, wow, like commitment is everything. (laughs) It is. Um, It is. And keep working on, again, there's still things about her that are a mystery and that's awesome. And same vice versa. I'm sure there's things where she scratches her head and goes, I can't believe. Sometimes she'll say, that's such a bachelor thing to do. (laughs) (laughs) I'll think I need to, okay, that's something that she noticed. I'm going to work on that. That's something that she, and it's just fun. I think guys respond to like, give me a challenge. Like, give me, give me the parameters here. Give me, what can I work on? And yeah. maybe women do too. Speaking of real quick, one last thing on the offense, defense thing, um, social media, you're right. Like you mentioned the texting thing, you know, social media is fascinating in that sometimes well-meaning there's, there's zero, uh, but somebody just like, Hey, Oh, I love your ministry. Or, oh, really bless me. Da, da, da. And you know, how can I pray for you? And, da, 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 da. and before you know, it's like, well, uh, yeah, you could pray about this. And now, oh, gee, thanks. You know, before you know it, if you're naive to that and, and it may be completely innocent, but just be aware if you're an emotionally open person, a lot of worship leaders, that's part of what makes you good at what you do. You're, you kind of wear that emotion on your sleeve and in, in a public gathering place, you, God uses that powerfully. And you, you're able to like, Hey, you know, let, let's gather together. And that, that feeling part of you, you know, we use that word passion a lot. Oh, passion. We need to lead with passion. And, and yet, you know, passion is a, it's a Pandora's box too. It can be, we need to keep that in check. And so sometimes, you know, if you're naive, and I feel like there was moments along the way where I didn't see that. And my wife can see it a mile away. She could see that. And yeah. uh, what, what I thought was a somewhat innocent little exchange was a bit hurtful. And I had to learn over especially the last five, six years with more social media, all these different, mm-hmm. you know, just just lingering on a communication like over a few days or a couple of weeks or that same person always coming back around. And it may be, right. you know, nothing was violated. And yet it's just, uh, and we, I don't want to be paranoid. I want to be able to encourage the opposite sex and, and be able to speak a kind word and a little word of encouragement. But so don't be paranoid and don't be afraid, but just don't be naive. And maybe as you do, maybe you share your all, like my wife has access to all my social media. So she, I think there's been over the years, maybe two or three that she would just say, Who, who's this person? Why? And right. I go, I don't really know. I don't have never met them, but, um, I think they're from, you know, this place. I think they're from here. And yeah, it seems like she's always kind of coming back around, mm-hmm. always kind of has something to say, you know, like, huh, really? Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe now those are worth blocking her or, but at least it makes just ignoring it just at least yeah. it makes me aware of like, yeah, just just keep that door kind of yep. pretty, pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. And when our wives say that, like, do not dismiss it. Amen. Like, just say, yes, honey. Amen. Like, I belong to you and I will listen to you if it makes you uncomfortable that I'm talking to this person. Like, I will cut that way back or all the way back. Yep. Like, because in the end, it's your wife you have to live with. And like, yep. you don't it doesn't matter what that other person thinks. Like that's not your wife. Like your, your wife is the one you come home to. So you want to make sure she's happy and that your relationship is strong. So I appreciate that a lot. Um, And and sorry, we add one more thing. Sometimes that Mm -hmm. temperament, be aware of chemistry sometimes on a worship team or if you're traveling, you know, there could just be a, you're you're kind of blindsided by a potential chemistry thing. So whether you're male or female, this could happen either way. And so you and your spouse have a certain chemistry thing that that's cool. But you know, it's not 100%. Sometimes something that another person sort of starts, uh, you're getting that from them, if you will, even a complete mm-hmm. stranger. It could be words of affirmation. It could just be a, yeah. an innocent sort of pat on the back or a touch or just a, what seems like an innocent, but it sort of awakens 
uh, something in you, like a sense of, oh, uh, you know, uh, you know, and if you're naive or uh, to that kind of a thing. So just be aware. These are things to just be aware of. Mm -hmm. So good, Paul. Yeah, I I really appreciate it. Before we talk about your new album, Behold Him, um, just maybe one final word of encouragement to worship leaders regarding maintaining a healthy marriage in their ministry. Practice love is patience, love is kind. So even when you're grumpy and you don't feel like it, you can still try to be kind. Uh, Mm -hmm. When you've just had an argument the night before, and the morning is still a little bit cold. You can still just do something kind. You can empty the dishwasher. You can still uh, make the bed, guys. You can actually make the bed sometimes, okay? Imagine that. You can actually take some of the clothes out of the dryer and maybe start folding some towels and putting socks and underwear together. You know, just that's kind. That's helpful. That's And uh, patience is simply not responding. And if you're really angry, get out of the house, get on a bike, go for a ride and practice some scream therapy. (laughs) Awesome. Seriously. I am, I'm serious. There were days back in the day. I just thought if I open my mouth and say what I'm thinking, I'm going to do a lot of damage. So I'm, I'm in my, I would just like leave the house get on my bike or go for a walk. And sometimes, uh, never mind. I was going to say, I'll tell you one time near, it's been 25 years ago, but man, I remember going into this little, there was like some woods near our house and I'd go there and I picked up a stick and I was like banging this tree with a stick. Cause it just felt good to like bang, bang a tree with a stick. And, uh, I've never laid a hand on my wife or anything, obviously. And I have no desire. That wasn't the idea. It was just getting this sort of anger out, get, getting the anger out. And I think, uh, go to lift some weights, go to the gym, get a punching bag and just be like, boom, boom, uh, work it out. And then come back in the house and be like, hi, babe. I love you, honey. Hi, babe. Yeah. And say, I'm sorry, babe. I misunderstood. And what can we, let's try again. You know, anyway. Yeah, that's good. Paul, your new album, uh, j- it released, um, what, a month ago. It's called yeah. Behold Him. Yeah. Behold him. And, um, what are a couple songs from that album that you feel like are really already beginning to resonate with churches that the worship leaders listening should take a listen to and consider introducing to their congregation? One or two, three. Yeah. Well, there's 10 songs on the album. (laughs) So out of, those are the 10 out of 50, you know, I kind of, when you do an album, you try to narrow down your songs from all the songs you've been writing. So um, most of the songs were co-written. There's a lot of good co-writers. Uh, I'll drop some names, Matt Redman, uh, Mia Fields, um, Jason Ingram, uh, Leslie Jordan. I feel like we wrote a sweet song called I am thankful, but the first song, what a good God I wrote with Brenton Brown. And I feel like mm-hmm. it's a good up tempo. You know, you always kind of need those opening statements and, uh, and it came, you know, Brenton's house, uh, he was was in the Malibu fires a couple of years ago. He burned mm. down. He lost everything and uh, lost all his possessions. And they still haven't rebuilt. It's still just – it's been uh, so hard. But a year ago, him and I were together and just spent a few days. And he was – just something he said from that. He said, you know, as, as hard as it's been, we have just felt God's presence. It's like – you know, and each time I doubt his goodness, I just – Like he just showed me that he's with us, you know, and just the way that came out of his mouth. I'm like, man, that that is such that's something we need to sing. You know, each time I doubt your goodness. Well, I'm not I'm not capable. of Each time I doubt your goodness, you show me you are with us. Your presence makes the difference. I've seen it every time. What a good God. So I really believe in that song and as a worship leader, you know, you're looking for that up-tempo opening state, mm-hmm. but I feel like it has substance. A lot of times opening up-tempo songs, you know, that, that's always been a challenge for me. Like I've wanted to write songs that are upbeat and yet have substance. So, mm. all right. Uh, the next one, a couple songs later is uh, behold him. I feel like is probably maybe the best song I've been a part of in the last 10 years. Wow. And I'm not exaggerating. It feels like a your name. It feels like an above all. Mm -hmm. It wasn't 
crafted over weeks and weeks. It was like just co-written over Skype with Mitch Wong. And uh, he was in Australia and I'm in New York and uh, I've actually never met him in person. <laughs> Mm. And we wrote this over, you know, it's Psalm 41 or Psalm 46 says, be still. We know that scripture and know that I am God. So over and over again, the, you know, the hook in the song is, uh, oh, be still and behold him. He who was before there was light. It's one of those where you try to write the gospel in one song. Mm. Like from before creation and then creation and then when he comes to earth and then the cross and then a resurrection. Wow. So I, I, I try to do that intentionally, like at least once a year, like, all right, let's write another song. Like, let's write the gospel in a song. Mm. Um, so I feel like it does that in the choruses, you know, Jesus, son of God, Messiah, the lamb, the roaring lion. Oh, be still. And behold him. So beautiful. Yeah, I'm just being honest. I'm from a, on a spiritual level. It feels like it's one of those where I don't even know if I had anything to do with it. I feel like I, my hands were open and God said, here you go. I just want you, <laughs> I want you to just deliver this <laughs> to the church, mm. like a FedEx guy or something. Maybe the last song is a million years, a million years. I feel like a lot of people, a lot of worship leaders have said, yeah, we, in a million years, will we see it then? Was the suffering and pain part of your plan? Will we finally see what we now believe, that you are making beauty out of everything? Mm. And, and we will still be singing, hallelujah. We will see you face to face. All heaven will adore your name forever. Jesus, you will reign. Anyway, it's, I think that's worth checking out. That's the last song in the project. That's so good. So I'm going to put links in the show notes to all those, um, not the songs, but to the album itself. Okay. Um, but are there any other places people can connect with you online? So I uploaded all my teachings that I thought were still good on our YouTube channel. So songwriting and are broken up into modules. So there's like 10 modules and then leading worship. If you want to know if I could spend three hours with you, whoever you're, whoever this is listening, it was, it would be what I would tell you if you and I could have sit down and have coffee. So we shot this all around New York city. So one's on songwriting, 10 modules. Maybe you can call up a friend and go through some of these together or worship leading. And then the third one is worship team workshop. So it's something your drummer, a bass player, a guitar player, like you're part of the worship team. Um, you could go through this module by module. It's completely free. Just go to YouTube and lead worship or YouTube Paul Balash. It'll take you there. And, uh, it's been a lot of work, but I think, you know, I feel like, again, it's been encouraging to hear feedback from people that are during this downtime quarantine. They've been going through these modules and just mm. being really encouraged. So, and just, uh, social media, just at Paul Balash, you know, on Instagram, Twitter and all that stuff, mostly Instagram. Twitter is so toxic. I, sometimes I get on it, but it's, it can be rough. <laughs> yeah. Well, Paul, you're one of the most generous people I know, um, both with just your heart and also with um, all the content you've created. So thank you for even this hour that we've been on Skype. Um, appreciate the time and appreciate all you do to bless worship leaders everywhere. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alex. Appreciate you, brother. You were a you were ahead of the pack on this podcast thing. You were, you were one of the first guys that just got that revelation from the Lord that, hey, this could become something. Uh, this long form interview format really has turned out to be amazing. But you were one of the first guys to recognize that. So may God continue to bless you and your ministry and your marriage and your family. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' Amen. name. Amen. All right, that's it for today's episode. I hope it was helpful to you. Remember, your marriage is your first ministry. If you lose your marriage, you're gonna lose your ministry too. So focus on your marriage, make it a priority. If you know somebody who needs to hear this episode, please send it on to them. And I will see you back here for another helpful episode in one month's time. God bless you guys. See you soon. <laughs>